Okay. Um, and Leipzig wants to become a smart city oh by the Triangular Project. Oh right. <laughs> What's that expression? Go on. Well, my, my questions here are pretty general since I haven't managed to figure out um, a lot about it. Yeah. Welcome to the club. Go on. Okay. Um, so, as I understand it, and most of this comes obviously from the Triangulum Project website, uh, they, they say something like they have had a meeting with experts and citizens and taken in all these, I, I don't know, consultations. Mm. Um, so I guess my first question is, is, is uh, how representative of the population were these meetings? Would you happen to know? How representative were those meetings? You haven't been there, so I understand the question. And of course... Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let, let me answer that first. Um, it, they were both very representative and not at all at the same time, which is interesting. Um, for example, there was one meeting where, um, well, let's let's say for a moment how the this, this smart city thing actually looks like when you're trying to get involved. It's like it's amazingly opaque. You don't actually know who's involved in it, as you already found out. Um, there are some loose contacts that got established in a few channels, but there is not the one go-to person. Um, and then if you look at all the, the paper that gets produced, or let's say the advertising brochures, um, it's, it's an interesting mix. There are basically three main groups in this whole thing. There is the city of Leipzig, which has an issue with with revenue to some extent um, because also as part of oh no I sound like left wing conspiracy theorist because of the neoliberal agenda um, no but because of the way and actually neoliberalism is to blame to some extent the, the way also governance is constructed um, the idea that the city has to run like a company has to be efficient, yada yada yada. Um, now we have um, there is we have companies which are owned by the city, which like utility companies, um, and they are, for example, in charge of the whole water infrastructure. But now they have this issue that this infrastructure is rotting away, and they want more money, but they don't get more money because there isn't enough money, and or this. The stuff is, yet, is is still working, so why should we fix it? It's working, right? Um, so they need to acquire money somehow, and the smart city initiative is actually a way to do that because it gives them the opportunity, for example, to rebuild and fix the infrastructure. And if they have attach a sensor to it, then so be it. If there's money, it's money. It's cool stuff that needs to get done gets done. So that's, that's one, one group. Then you have this, you have a lot of, not a lot, but a few private companies who are in desperate search for a market where the cybernetic utopia we were promised with the internet of things, there's a buzzword, um, didn't really materialize. So they're playing in there too, trying to create a market for their stuff. It's for and foremost companies which deal with home automation, for example. I still wonder what a, what, what is smart in a, in a home that's automated, why it's not just an automated home, but apparently it doesn't sell as well. So there's this also a, if you want to say a money slash market driven group, uh, and then there is civil society, which it's, which is involved because the EU has a process which requires civic 
engagement. That's a really good thing about the EU. Um, and that's how people like I come into play. Like, not just me, there's also um, the Bündnis for Privatsphäre, which is involved, the Haus und Wagenrad. Um, so it's a, it's a loose group, a hodgepodge of, of people. Um, the Privat, um, that's the one up here who did this. Yes, um, yes, um, I was yeah, aiming for that. And, and we're actually also trying to to work with that and apparently we seem to be the only thing or the only thing the only people who take a political stance with that um because cities or polis in greek it's, it's actually what gave politics its name it's where it stems from um and we actually want a, a place where we can all live together and we don't care so much about markets and everything. And that's, for example, why we gave out the slogan of a cooperative city instead of a smart city. Then, so if back to the beginning, if you look at all the text they produce, they're highly unspecific. It's, it's all about, yay, computers, maybe? And yay, future. But that's it. And it's incredibly vague. You know, if you just look at the words they use, they they either relate to a bright future, but they don't know tell you how they want to get there, or they cater towards this market ideology of increased efficiency. But then I'm asking also, why does it have to be efficient? Like there are things that don't need to be efficient. And there is sometimes it's good if things aren't efficient. Um, so just efficiency for its own sake doesn't save you much, and also computers for their own sake don't help. That's also something I learned, especially in crisis response. It's like computers aren't always a good idea. Um, so yeah. Hmm. Could you tell me a bit about the um, Privatsphäre? Bündnis für Privatsphäre. Bündnis. Sorry. Bündnis für Privatsphäre, yes, which, which roughly translates to cooperation, as in people working together for privacy. Um, there are a bunch of people, um, and they, for example, meet here to sublet. They are one of the groups who meet regularly, um, and they focus on this whole debate about privacy and then also data retention surveillance everything comes to it they're also the group that holds the crypto parties they are the group that uh yes the the crypto parties yes they do that right i was confusing it with the crypto con where there's a huge thing tape behind you people on the camera um okay and what is um this groups, I'm going to just say these groups, mm -hmm. uh, stands towards the, the smart city thing. You, you mentioned the, that. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the Bündnis für Privatsphäre, um, they, are, they, they have this, this notion that... Uh, okay, in, in Germany we have Datenschutz, which is like data protection, which is like the political and technical means to, to implement the protection of, of data and also preserving one's own right for what's called informationale Selbstbestimmung in, in German, which roughly translates to self-determination in terms of information, roughly. Um, it's an interesting concept. Um, and so they say data protection isn't a, a, a private thing. And there they say private as in non-public. Um, for example, there's this, this weird thing that there's this public sphere and the private sphere, but somehow data protection, which actually affects the public to a significant extent, is shifted off to private. So it's left to, to everyone as an individual, but politics yeah, or actually politics, as in the collective, does not tend to get involved. 
Um, and for example, one interesting question that's raised is like, who owns the data? If I have a temperature sensor that's in my house, who owns that data? Is it me? Is it you? Is it the company who produces the data? And it's really interesting because there is to, to because I, I don't own the data because I don't create the data as the, the, the consumer. But then should a company that produced a thing automatically also all own all the data that it produces? It's like a huge limbo and it's really interesting. It's especially when it comes to, to medical machinery, like who owns the data that's collected by medical machines? That's really interesting. And there are cases, for example, in the US where the, the producer of, it's not a pacemaker, but like a thing that checks your pulse, mm -hmm. they claim ownership over the data. And, and then you you run into problems like now this although this data is there and it's like one of these few cases where a, a huge trove of data exists which could be exploited for good now for example science can't use it because the data has private ownership if it's legit is another question but as of now there's private ownership so science can't even use it which is like a super weird situation um, I don't use swear words now um, so the Bündnis für Privatsphäre argues for security and privacy by design mm -hmm. in all the things that get rolled out mm -hmm. in the smart city. Um, also, where I'm also in line with is just pull the, the pants down on big data uh, because also in, in the smart city statements, they, they talk about big data, yada, yada. But what does big data mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just means a lot of data, but then also a lot. That, like, what does it mean? I have people when they hear like 10 megabytes, that's a lot of data. And also I, I work with terabytes of data on a regular basis. That, like terabytes of data, I'm cool with that. I, I can work with that. So it's not big for me. So it's a, like big data is also a, a nonsense, or I wouldn't say a nonsense, but it's a a mythically charged name, phrase, where people project their ideas onto without um, actually defining it. And in that sense, it's really interesting when it comes to a a field in philosophy called fictionalism, where things that we imagine start to constitute the things that are. In another example is the nation. The, the, the nation as itself doesn't exist. I can't punch the nation in the face and I can't lock a nation in a box. A nation only exists because a lot of people imagine that there is a nation. And so does big data. A lot of big data just happens because a lot of people imagine that there is something like big data. And then, especially if you, now the machine learning is the whole thing, and that's also really interesting from a, if you take a step back and don't take a technical view on it, but a more, view it's more influenced by the humanities. If you say machine learning, you're implying learning, and learning also implies a mind of some sort, because a mind can learn. Um, but machine learning isn't is nothing like that. Machine learning is just automated statistics. But if you would call it automated statistics, people would start to think about it way differently. It's way more mundane, but it would also be way more truthful. Um, then the other issue, which the Bündnis und Privatsphäre focuses on right now with regard to a smart city, is uh, data protection in the Internet of Things. Because apparently smart city means that you have to roll out a lot of network stuff and not a lot of network things. I don't know why, but apparently you have to. Um, because otherwise it's not smart. Okay. Um, then a, an idea I, I brought up was, was having collectives for, for data which is a reiteration of the old hacker idea of like having decentralized data. But also the, um, the, the issue is if you have centralized data, you have effects of the economy of scale. 
Um, and I think it would be way, way more useful also from a social perspective, uh, actual social, not, not internet social, um, to, for example, have a data center in your neighborhood. And you can just go there because if something goes wrong, you know how to punch in the face. If you need help, you know who to ask. Like try to ask Google for help. Google won't help you. They just won't because you're not important to them. And also, I don't want to pick on Google. It's the same with all, all other companies, especially if you're not paying. Yeah, you're not important to them. That's why you get referred to FAQs, the idea, yada, yada, but no one sits down with you. But sometimes it's better to sit down with someone and like walk them through something. And that would be way easier if you just organize it all well, basically on a neighborhood scale. Sort of like the sublab, like we have this thing called Techniksprechstunde, where uh, it's sort of like a doctor's appointment for your gear. You basically walk in, we have, want to have something fixed, we, we help you to fix it. Um, and just replicate that model, because that also would, would mean that people understand what's going on. It's not just a, a producer-consumer relationship, where the basically the producers in control and the consumer is passive because the producer by producing certain things or not producing certain things they are in control of what's happening and the user or the consumer can either suck it up or don't but it's basically passive and that would get dismantled to some extent because people become empowered to do stuff with them on the to do stuff with their tech or to don't do stuff with their tech so it's that, um, and then also basically autonomy of data. Like you, you own your data, you can do with your data whatever you want. But also have means in place to ensure it still exists or it, it continues to exist. So that's at least the, the, the angle of the business for the right. how, how would a data uh, center like that work? I'm I'm trying to imagine like okay so you co you're collecting all this information all this data in the house via all mm -hmm. these IoT sort of sensors mm -hmm. so, and it goes to the data center. Mm. First, first thing, why do you think there need to be sensors in the house? Why did you say that? Oh, because because we were talking about. Uh, well, okay, not the house, but the city itself, right? The infrastructure. Yeah, but, but why do why do sensors need to be there? Mm. Instinctively it comes about because, you know, when we talk about a smart city. I know that yeah, yeah and that, that's actually what I wanted to point out. It's yeah. like it those people instinctively refer to you, but as I as I challenged you, you were like, Well, that's because people say that and I'm like yes it's 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 to, to a large extent it's recursive people say that because people say that um, so one thing is actually to challenge this whole notion of do we actually need that and that's actually one of the things we we want to um, be want to have in the spotlight is like what are the actual costs of digitizing a lot of things because there are a lot of costs involved with it um, not only threats to privacy, but also um, digitizing things tends to make them more malleable and to some extent more uniform, especially if you put them in a larger context. Um, and so the, the question is like, what, what does it cost? And also, for example, what is the cost of the information? Um, how much money do I have to spend to have a certain bit of information? And is it actually worth it? Um, let's say we could know perfect for, perfectly for sure where every bicycle is in the city of Leipzig. But for each bicycle, it would cost us a million and up per hour. No one would say, oh, no, 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 that is too much. Okay, there's an obvious case where just because it's digital, it doesn't make it better and it doesn't make it even worth it. And there are a lot of things that are way more subtle, they're not so obvious, not so extreme as the cartoonish example I just gave. Um, so that's also an interesting thing that has to be debated, I think. 
uh, because most people think just because we stick a microprocessor in it or a microcontroller just is a good thing. That's why I'm searching the thing. Um, but going back to how it would work, um, I'm, I actually don't know. I don't have a fixed idea. Um, two years ago, I gave a talk about living in the dark net. Uh, because that's what I did to that time and I still do to a large extent and I actually think that a few technologies rolled out in what's called the darknet are pretty interesting in that in, in this very perspective um, a, a simpler one is Tor for example um, for those who don't know torproject.org is the website to check it out um, it's sold as sold. It's not sold as free software. You can download it, compile it yourself. Um, but it's most people think about it as an anonymity service, and that's actually the the, the main project aim. But I use it for a whole different thing, and that is to host my own services, like to have an onion service running. Which is, if you want to know, like that's how all these. Bad things on the dark market happen. There are so called onion services, uh, and they're not as bad as you think. Um, but there are some pretty weird things. Okay, <laughs> let's not go there. Um, or later. Okay. Um, but but what it, for example, does if you have an onion service, it, it it spits out an address where you can reach this service. And going back to how Tor works, basically Tor works by having a lot of nodes sharing bandwidth like your smartphone for example could donate bandwidth to the tor network and it would be a node in this network and it's usually used to just just relay information but like those nodes can also for example be a a single board computer like your raspberry pi or so it's in your home or like a server in a data center um and if you install what's called an onion service, um, you get an address that's tied to the Tor network that, so you can find this service in the Tor network. And the good thing about that is you, you bridge what's called the net problem, the network address translation problem. Because if you run a service at your home, um, how, how technical is the audience? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Hello, people from the future. You, when you finally have IPv6, you will not know what I'm talking about. But back in the olden days, um, no. Um, okay, really simple. Um, if you have so-called packet switch networking, like TCP IP, basically the intranet, you have what's called an IP. An IP is an identifier for your computer so people can find it. Um, but that needs to be routable. Routable means that a router knows where to send the data. Um, think of it like a telephone number. But then also you sometimes have within the building certain internal telephone numbers that, that aren't, pop, uh, aren't seen by the outside that only work inside this building. And it's basically what netting is. Mm -hmm. If you are on your home network, chances are you're behind your plastic router that ties it to the internet. We have one IP on a plastic router that faces to the internet, but then all your devices behind that also talk to the internet. And what the router does, it translates the network address, which is had on the internet, to the one that's in your internal network. Yeah, and what's called extension. yeah, network address translation. That's how it goes. Um, but, but, but the problem is, while it works perfectly fine if you want to call out, someone's want to call in that doesn't work because the router doesn't know where this packet has to go um, it only works if you enable something called port forwarding but that requires you that you have networking knowledge yada yada, yada. no fun but it, it's easy to do actually but then the question is should you need to know it. so what you could use or what you could do it but oh wait go back but it also requires that you know the IP of the plastic router which also depending on your provider can change and often actually does change. So just because you know the IP address now, it doesn't mean that's the same when your router reconnects, for example, when you get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. okay. 
just check. Okay, just checking. Um, so if so, what if you set up what's called an, an onion service? Um, it as I said, you install it on a set it up on a Raspberry Pi, which is the popular Singapore computer right now, in or one of the ones in 2016. Um, then you get this address, and if you have a client for a Tor network, there's there there's a client, but there's for example the Tor browser bundle you can download if you want to have a web-based service. So if you, if you use this address, you can basically reach it. But you can also bridge NAT, and also you authenticate the the service. So what you have is you basically have a phone number you can call and you can be sure you're actually talking to your server, which is not the case necessarily with IP or DNS when you're typing www, I don't know, example.com, it may give you different IP addresses, yada, yada, yada. Um, and for example, I can you can now use this, this, this computer which has a certain service running and just, for example, move it to a friend's house and plug it in there. The address stays the same. You don't have to know which internet connection this person is on. It can be a normal broadband connection, can be a mobile mobile connection, like using, I don't know, whatever the, the thing is, LTE, UMTS, 3G, 5000G, I don't know. Um, so you can use all that and the address stays the same. So this technology, like going back to initial one, there, for example, would be a way to connect back to your home or what you think are I wouldn't call it your home, but what you think are your computing devices. And this technology is actually used a lot in this privacy slash darknet, etc. context. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call it darknet, but that's a popular term if you want to search for press. Um, so yeah, that's would be one way to do it. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and I think the, the idea is less about having a data center as we think about is today like rows of servers but more having a central place where your computation happens and that you can control whatever shape it is that can be a box under your desk this can be a server in a dedicated data center but you mentioned that it should be somewhere where someone can go yes and look for help Yes. Right. And that brings me to another question, which is, um, not, even before we reach the smart city with all its IoT and you know all the infrastructure mm -hmm. stuff, um, I guess I can say the common man doesn't already doesn't really know how to navigate uh, you know, the technology we have today. There's a yes. lot of things going on. Yes. In the background, that yes, yeah, we don't understand. Yes. So with this, I suppose, can I call it the increased sophistication of the smart city? Do you think people are, will be equipped to deal with these things? Yes. Because people adjust. Um, the, the, the people will be able to deal with it. If it's to their advantage, I don't know. Um, but just for example, like the field of medicine, like deepened over time, and there's a lot we don't know these days, or that the common man or woman doesn't know these days. But medicine doesn't mean that they cannot, can't not, can't not know it. And I think the the more interesting thing is not should they know it. I don't think they should know it because there are people who have better things to do than troubleshoot their computing equipment because they raise your kids or they save your life. A brain surgeon doesn't need to know what the difference between an ARM and an AMD 64 CPU is. Why should they? It just has to work. But the interesting thing or the important thing is it has to be legible to the user. That means 
on the, on the simple device level that you have a user interface that doesn't lie to the user, that doesn't oversimplify things and makes it legible to the user, like gives an insight on what's the internal state, etc., etc., and not by having like 10,000 pages of end user license agreements in terms of service. That has to be radically simplified. Um, but also, I think people will grow up and will get more, there will be more folk knowledge about these kinds of technology. So I'm I'm pretty sure this will adjust. Um, but what I think is important that we can, that you can look into all the devices if you want to. But it's not that you have to because that's, that's basically Linux. Um, that You still have to take care of, or you have to sit down and figure Linux out more than I think is needed. Um, and that's where other operating systems are way more successful because at least people don't feel the need that they have to sit down. Um, but the good thing about Linux is that you can open it up and take it apart and look at almost every part if you want to. and given time, energy, and resources, you can figure them out. Um, that's not the case with other technologies. Um, that's why I'm, I'm a huge fan of open design, but not for the sake of openness, but more for having the ability to learn, make it legible and accountable, going back to politics, if needed. Mm -hmm. So, and if you want to have a a more, more tangible idea of what, what this data center should look like, think about the common library. And that is actually a good model. There you have a place where you have a technology, which is sufficiently old, called books and reading, but you can figure things out and you can discover new things. And you can also share the resources you have because nothing holds you back from just donating your books to a library. It's totally cool. Do it. And just use that model and bring it to the 21st century. Okay. More questions? Perhaps two more. I'm curious. Okay, yeah. sorry. You, spent, you could ask more if you want. You spent some time in uh, Singapore. Yes. Yeah. How long did you spend there? Uh, it was a month this year. And. I think two months the last time. No. Also a month because I just did just get a 30 day visa. Mm -hmm. I think. I don't know. Sort of like at least a month. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Did you visit the hackerspace? Yes, I visited hackerspace SG. Right, right. And how, they, how, do you find, how do you find it? Um, it's actually pretty similar. Like, hackerspace. SG is pretty similar to Sublet to some extent, except Sublet is cooler, as in not that hot. God, I would so die if Hackerspace SG wouldn't have an, um, an AC, but okay. Um, and I'm, I'm still thankful for them because they gave me a laptop when my laptop broke down in the beginning of this year because I... I went to Kenya first, and then because I also had a, a thing to do, it's like, oh, it was horrible. My laptop died, and uh, so that's why I'm still grateful to Hackerspace SG. Um, so in that, so it's it's pretty similar to Sublab actually, but I, but I feel there's more stuff going on in Hackerspace SG, mm -hmm. um, which are. And to some extent, people are more focused on shipping things. Shipping things. Yeah, as in shipping product, I think mm -hmm. getting a thing done. I mean, there is there's Michael who's building the uh, building a 3D printer. Is it Michael? It's Michael, right? Mm, I'm not sure. I think Bob was working on the 3D printer. Bob too. Yeah. Can't quite remember. I think anyway, a couple of people, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, 
so yes, yeah, so they're they're actually working on, on things and the hackerspace SG due to its its setup is way more conducive to it. Like I mean here we're now we're before we started this interview we were looking around like this is pretty hot in here, like where should we go? Um so that's where a thing where at least the sublab in, in terms of architecture isn't that conducive to people hanging out and doing stuff because you're way more subordinate to the weather conditions than you think. Um, what else is different? Um, you mentioned that there seems to be more activities. Yes. And I, I, I don't know whether I'm right, so maybe you can correct me here, mm -hmm. but coming from Singapore, there were, there were just a ton of activities throughout the entire throughout the island where technology yes. is concerned. Yes, that's also a thing. Yeah, and then when I came here, it doesn't seem like there were a lot. Um, why do you think there's this difference? Um, like for example, yeah, all the uh, programming language communities, I yes, really yes, find them here. Yes, I, uh, um, good for, for pointing it out. Um, but what I was also saying is, for example, first to close the first thing, um, in Hackerspace XG, for example, we have Chinmai, who is doing the um, Rebuild SG thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we also had a radio show. I was involved with that, but then the person moved away, um, and so it just fizzled out. Um, then now, when what you mentioned with the whole buzz in, in, in Singapore, um, the thing with Singapore is you take you I address you as a Singaporean. You at least is or Singapore seems to take their or take its authoritarian capitalism really seriously. Um and Leipzig is way more subversive. Um there are a lot of things going on that just aren't public. And that's also I understand that you get can, that you get the feeling, but there's a lot of things going on in Leipzig that aren't on the public internet that you just know by word of mouth. Mm, kind of, but I think I would need more time to find out. All yes, of them. like for example, the bike kitchen, um, which the bike kitchen that happens behind the Japanese house. Yes, and then there is the, mm -hmm. yeah, the repair cafe at Wurzner Strasse. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, e even here uh, in, in Sublab, there are a lot of things that don't seem to be gotten out. You know, mm -hmm. you have activities here, whether it's the Saturday kitchen thing or mm -hmm. the Repair Cafe. Yeah, yeah. That, that's it's pretty well known, if I don't by them. We even have a Twitter account. <laughs> yeah, it, that one is, is quite good. Mm -hmm. um, but for a bunch of other things, I don't think it, it, the word gets out that much. Um, and I'm not sure, that's why I'm not sure whether it's because um, I'm not sure whether it's it's that there are a lot of things here but publicity is low or whether generally activity is just low I also don't know hmm. um, but as I said the a lot of the local scene is has, has overlaps or is inspired by what is called the autonomous left. Mm. Um, like left ring, left liberal, left anarchism. Um, and so there's a, a huge focus on on the DIY aspect of things, um, but not necessarily in getting the word out. Because also, if you think back, if you're if you do political work, you don't necessarily want everyone to know. So it also in, in, informs the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why promotion and outside or marketing to outsiders is not on the, on the, on the forefront of mm -hmm. things like people. It's usually an afterthought. Right. Um, th that's, it's more like a, a cultural attitude, which which gets reflected in that. Um, but since a few things you mentioned, there's also the uh, G36 or their 
which is like a basically two blocks where you can do welding and everything. There's still a lot of going on, but necessarily not public. Um, and also there is less There's less talking, more doing, to some extent. Um, like, for example, getting internet to the refugees. There were a lot of people involved. They just did it, but they didn't talk about it. Is the Freifunk thing? The Freifunk, yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, and how do how do people meet other people then? So, for example, if you were like me, you come here, and let's say you want okay. to meet other people doing Python. How? It's actually... It's actually not that easy. I'm, I'm with you in that respect, yes. But it's also because Leipzig feels like a big family. I mean, you just have half a million inhabitants, I think. Roughly, mm. it like it's not that big. Like, and if you walk around Leipzig, it actually feels like a small town. Mm, yes. Yeah, and it's like you can take your bike and you reach every place in Leipzig in like forty-five minutes max. Um, and then things tend to concentrate in several places where you then just need. 10 minutes or so to get to go somewhere and it's and it's a lot I think it sort of ties back to the whole smart city uh, smart city thing mm. um, it's a lot more informal and travels along personal lines than having like a buffet of information to grab from so for for foreigners who's coming into the city the easiest thing would be just to go to the sublab, say hello, or even better, just write to the sublab, dash, discuss, mailing list, because that's the open, it's an open one. Mm. And there are a lot more people on it and people tend to answer. Mm. Yeah, that would be my advice. If not, there are certain parts, or at least for 2016, to check out, there is the sublab and also yeah, Japan, the Japanese, also Japanese house, the, the Japanese house. These are two of the, the spots to go to, which are also pretty um, disjunct. So you meet a disjunct group of people there. A disjoint, not disjunct, disjoint group of people. Disjoint. Yeah. Like there are different people going here and then they go to um, mm. the Japanese house. Generally, I, I haven't seen any overlaps so far. But I'm also I don't, I don't keep track of who's where. But if I go to the sub lab and in this general area, I tend to see the same faces, which is different from from the east part of town. We are in the west part of town with the sub lab. Right. Okay. Um, and where, where are all the women hackers? Where are all the female hackers? Good question. I don't know. Um, there is a group called Cold Girls, which meets a block down this way in the um, Social Impact Lab. And that's the only dedicated female group of at least coders I know. Why are you asking that? Uh, because everywhere I go, whether it's, well, whether it's Singapore or Vienna or Prague or... Mm -hmm. Alborg or here, um, I find that Singapore's not that bad actually. No, it's not. Yeah. It's, oh, it's actually surprised. pretty decent. Yeah. Yeah. The, the gender difference, as I was saying, was, is is very stark. Yes. And so um, one of the things I'm trying to do, of course, is try and get to the women and ask them their views on Leipzig. I I, I can hook you up if you want. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> that sounds so wrong, I'm Dave. <laughs> Yeah, but um, so I'm wondering as well, uh, 
Of course, in different places, it could be due to different reasons why the women don't come to a hackerspace. So I'm wondering, why do you think over here it's it's like that? Um, the culture around um, over here doesn't mean the sublab in particular or German hackerspaces. Uh, let's say sublab. Uh, culture. Um, the code girls actually started out meeting here, but then over to the social impact lab because it's a nicer location, and I don't blame them for that. And the, the the problem still is that Sublib is inhabited by a lot of nerds, and um, it, it has its own set of complications, which is not which are not necessarily welcoming to outsiders. Um, I, I observed it multiple times that, for example, when there was someone at the Phantomspeiser, like which is the free for all kitchen we have here, um, there was a female bodied person who had a problem with her laptop and then just ask like one guy if they can help and he like yeah it helped and then he just like started typing on the console and she was like okay what's going on and then like soon there were like two others and she was not explicitly but implicitly pushed away from her own computer and then you had like three nerds geeking out on her computer of what could be wrong and she's like okay and that stuff it still happens Oh. Um, so that's also, I think, a reason mm. why. Um, also, we have a code of conduct and there are really decent people here. There's still some, some certain dynamics still play out. Plus, the, the brand of the sublab is that of as a nerd cave to some extent. Mm. Yes, there are cultural things going on, but most people know die Phantomspeisung and then there isn't too much the then, and then, and then for example you have like the, the CryptoCon or the which is a, a conference on cryptography secure communication digital rights yada 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 but it's also a very male-dominated field, so... It's like, I, I, I'm not happy, and I, don't, I understand why a lot of people don't feel... Like, it, it's even me, like, there are, there are weeks where I just don't want to go to the sublet because there are too many nerds. Um... I don't want to say that's the culture because it implies it can't be changed. Um, but I think it may it needs more effort than just having a code of conduct and saying, hey, we're open. It, at the point we are now, it needs to be actively fostered. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's my analysis of the current situation. Okay. All right. Um, I guess final question. So uh, I've been the one asking the questions and kind of yeah. guiding the interviews along and finding out stuff. But let's say if if you were the one who is who wants to find out stuff about Sublet and about Leipzig hacking in Leipzig, what kind of question would you ask? Finding out stuff about Sublet. Yeah. What would I ask? Yeah. Damn, I'm also poisoned because I know all this stuff already. <laughs> um, a few of the questions you already asked, it's like, why isn't there more going on? Uh, which I also in part answered, um, but... What else would I have 
but ask. What would you want to know? That's a better question. What I um, what I want to know is where where's all the awesome shit going on? Um, I mean. Now there is a loose group forming around creative coding here at the sublab, but then it's it's really really loose. Like we met like one time I think, um, okay. and three weeks, or four weeks. Um, then that's what I want to know. I would really like to know where all these hackers with like their baklavas behind their MacBooks, like I see on TV, <laughs> on stock photos, because I miss them here, actually. No, I don't. Um, okay. what, what, what I would... That's actually a good question. It's really hard to answer for me. Um, doesn't have to be about Sublab, just like saying, or maybe even about Joey. Okay, what was the initial question then? Well, what would you want to know about the uh, hacking scene? Oh, what, I would, what would I want to know about the hacking scene? How do you prepare yourself for being at the center stage? For being? At the center stage. Because that's a thing that's that happened over the last few years. Like DB Hacker is a new archetype of of human in society. Like it's a person that's like well versed with technology, has a work ethic, which is to some extent detrimental to their own personal health. Um, st stuff like that. I mean, you're at Facebook and people at Facebook are called or call themselves hackers. And I'm like, Facebook, you know how big Facebook is? It's like, like it's so in the face of what people think about themselves as hacker as being underground. No, the hacker scene is center stage, but as a, as a collective, to a large extent, we haven't caught up with it. Um, that's why all the dirty laundry comes to the light now. Like for example, the the insane lack of non-white males. I mean, honestly, you pointed out, yeah, female members are missing. Yes, but they are also we're missing people of color, and you can't tell me that there aren't any pe persons of color in in Leipzig. I know several, but. Then it can also be just statistics because they are actually a, an actual minority in, in Leipzig in terms of the overall population. But and still, why why don't we go to them or why don't aren't they coming to us? Um, then yeah, and then also, how does the hacker scene know when to shut up? Because now there is this sort of thinking that also we're we are the center stage, but at the same time we are like treated like we are sort of underground. I'm like, um, so there's this dichotomy, and then there is this oh, like these days, like everything apparently can be solved with data or smart something i'm like no there are things that are genuinely hard and there are things where just people used to go and you just shut up because other people thought about it very very hard and for example like if you look at a lot of companies that are disruptive um which is basically just a euphemism for sidestepping the law and institutional processes and things we have put in place to protect society as a whole, that's not disruption, that's just like being an a social asshole on the cost of everyone else. 
I mean, look at Uber. Now, their Uber in 2016 was a company which, what did they do? They sort of were in the, in the taxi business. And they were basically an app and you could like prostitute yourself with your car to be an unlicensed taxi. That's roughly the model. Yeah, that sums it up. Um, they're... There's a thing in place, but there's a reason why we have unions. There's a reason why we have social insurance or a BNB. Who, who is responsible? It's like someone dies when you rent out your home, and there's it's a different thing when you do it occasionally because your friends are already doing it on a commercial basis. There's a reason why hotels are constructed a certain way, just to ensure the safety of everyone involved, and just saying screw that, we just build an app and don't care about the rest, uh, doesn't cut it. And there are things where where I wish actually also the hacker community like would speak up and would be way more politicized. And also sit down and listen to others and not just talking about them and thinking they can do better just because they can open a terminal. Just because I can open a, ter- a terminal doesn't mean I can do brain surgery. Doesn't mean I can save the life of a child. Nope. Okay. I think that was pretty great. Oh, you're welcome. Sorry for being ranty at the end. Oh, it's great. I, I like how you uh, use the word was where Uber was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> People was. in a hundred years will look it up because they will want to see your work. So, and I hope Uber will be gone by then. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll just turn this off. Ta-da! Meep meep.